Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Diana McCollum, and I'm the project director of the Pathways to Work Evidence Clearinghouse. Um, we're very excited to have you for our webinar, which is focused on using implementation details. And our goal today is to really highlight content that's new to the Pathways Clearinghouse website um, since it was first released last summer. And in particular, we really wanna talk about the implementation details that have been added for more than 50 interventions that demonstrate favorable findings. So these are really the interventions that may be able to move the needle on labor market outcomes for people with low incomes. And we're really, we're joined today by an esteemed group of panelists that we're excited to have. And they'll describe how pa practitioners can use implementation information. And so um, after this, I'll transition to an overview of the Pathways Clearinghouse, focusing on the review and provide you with a very brief website demonstration. And then we'll transition over to our panelist discussion. Right? And I do want to encourage participants, you know, if there are questions that come up over the course of the, the overview, the demonstration, or the panelist discussion, please submit your um, questions within the Q&A. Right. And at this point, I'll turn it over to our project officer, Kim Klum, at the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. Um, and Kim will talk about why providing detailed implementation information is really important for this project. Thank you so much, Diana. So as Diana said, I'm Kim Klum, a senior social science analyst in the Division of Economic Independence at the Office of Planning, Research and Evaluation, or OPRE within ACF. And with Claire DeSalvo and Amzi Hecht, I'm part of the federal team that's responsible for overseeing the Pathways to Work Evidence Clearinghouse and ensuring it achieves its objectives. So on behalf of OPRE, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us, setting aside time on your Thursday afternoon or for some of you morning to be with us. <clears throat> We're really excited to have you here. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share the Pathways Clearinghouse with the stakeholder group for whom this clearinghouse was and website was designed, those who oversee and implement TANF and related employment programs and policies. The Pathways Clearinghouse is meant to be a resource for practitioners, program administrators, policymakers, and stakeholders. But in order for it to be useful, potential users have to know about it. So it's really gratifying to have time to showcase the Clearinghouse with this audience in particular. The Pathways Clearinghouse reflects a, really a very thorough, careful, and thoughtful amount of work by our team, which is a team made up of staff from OPRE, Mathematica, and Mathematica's partners. And to create the Pathways Clearinghouse, the team engaged in extensive consultations with a broad range of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. These consultations helped us ensure that potential users of the Clearinghouse would find that it was relevant and meaningful to their needs. And when we consulted stakeholders, many of whom um, are represented, hopefully, on this webinar, we heard that what people really need when practitioners are seeking evidence about what works to help job seekers who are low income succeed in the labor market, they really want to know as much as possible about how that information translates onto what they already do. To make that translation, they want as much in-depth information as possible about the services that were provided and what it takes to provide those services, everything from staffing and staff competencies to partnerships to costs. And we really took that feedback to heart, and it propelled us to dig as deep as we can into the information that researchers have provided about the interventions they studied. So the focus of our time with you here today will be on that information, that implementation information. I want to thank in advance our panelists for the conversations we're going to be having during this webinar on the relevance of the Pathways Clearinghouse to their work in general, and more specifically on how information Pathways has collected about the implementation of evidence-based interventions helps them improve their own approaches. I'm really looking forward to that conversation. And with that, I'll hand it back to Diana. Great. Thanks, Kim. All right, so I'll just walk through a, an overview of the Pathways Clearinghouse, um, just so that we're all starting on the same page. So this, this project is a congressionally mandated review of the evidence to help the federal government learn what works best to help people who have low incomes to succeed in the labor market. And the, the foundation of this work really starts with a rigorous process for reviewing studies and then assessing the effectiveness of the collective body of evidence for different interventions. 
So we start out by conducting a systematic review to find all studies that meet um, a set of eligibility criteria that we've outlined in a protocol. And I'll show you how to find our, our protocol a bit later when I do the demonstration. But um, after that, we rate the quality of the studies that we identified against the standards that we've established and assign ratings to individual studies, of high, moderate, and low. And to give you a snapshot of the, the way that we look at the kinds of studies that we look at, um, a high-rated study, for example, includes studies that are supported by a well-executed randomized control trial with low attrition. So when we say a study that me, uh, is rated high, we mean that we can be fairly confident in the study's findings. So for each of the interventions that we review, um, again, taking in the information across the body of studies for that particular intervention, we go ahead and assess the effectiveness of each of four specific groups of domains of outcomes. So the ones that we focus on are earnings, employment, public benefit receipt, and education and training. The Pathways Clearinghouse really is you know, built to be a credible uh, and trusted resource. And so as Kim was saying, we really, through the inception of the project, have engaged a series of experts, including practitioners, policymakers, and, and researchers. And that's in the development of the research standards and how we identify which studies uh, have high quality information but also in the development of the website to make sure that it's accessible. That, that is another key tenant for this work, is making sure that the website can be a, a single source of information for um, employment service providers and TANF administrators. So to date, we've reviewed more than 177 in, uh, interventions, and that's based on over 250 or so studies. Um, and we have new reviews underway. So the, the website really features the find interventions that work search tool to help you get to that information quickly. So that'll be the primary piece that I show in the demo. And this is just a very high level overview, but um, in terms of the research that's targeted by the Pathways Clearinghouse, we really focus on those interventions that are designed to improve family self-sufficiency through employment and training services. Um, and that is for uh, families uh, with low incomes in particular. The Pathways Clearinghouse uh, focuses on inter uh, interventions, as I mentioned, for individuals with low income, but that also includes, but it's not limited to TANF recipients. The scope is, is also limited um, in the following ways. So the research must have been released in 1990 or later. Um, and it focuses on interventions conducted for um, uh, individuals ages 16 and older. And the studies that we reviewed had to have been conducted in the United States or Canada. All right. So some of you may have visited the website before. So I want to talk a little bit about what's new on the website. And then I'll transition over to showing you what's new. So as I highlighted before, um, one thing that we've done is really provide uh, more information on the implementation of those interventions that have favorable findings across the outcomes that I mentioned. Um, so you're able to access that and I'll, I'll show how, how that works. Um, we also have sample characteristics for interventions um, where you can see the race and ethnicity of participants for a given intervention and the location of um, uh, studies for a given intervention. So you can see that kind of in a, a nice snapshot. Um, at this point, you can also customize your search to sort by the size of the effect of a, of a given outcome domain that you're interested in. So, and I'll, I'll show this, but you can run a search for interventions and then, you know, identify those or sort them by those that have the greatest um, impact on earnings or employment or the other outcomes that you might be interested in. Um, and then you can also customize your search to look for interventions implemented and tested in specific regions or states. And this is something that we saw come up in some of the preliminary questions for the webinar, but you do have that ability as well. And these are really just some of the enhancements that we've made, but we've made these enhancements really in response to user feedback, just to make sure that administrators are able to easily find the information that's most important to them. 
So next, we just wanted to start off with a quick poll question. Um, and this asks, how often do you visit the Pathways Clearinghouse website? And the options are weekly, monthly, when I see a Pathways Clearinghouse newsletter, I've never really used the site, or I've never heard of the site until today. So I'll give people a moment to go ahead and submit their answers. But um, as I mentioned, you know, if you visited the, um, the website sort of last summer, closer to the launch, um, there have been multiple content updates since then. So, you know, it's certainly worthwhile to go ahead and revisit the site so that you can find some of that implementation information that we've continued to add. So much more content to explore. Um, and then if you're wondering about the newsletter, um, I'll get to the demo right after this and I'll show you how you can sign up for that. And you know you can stay up uh, to date with new content that's released at Pathways by signing up for that um, newsletter. But let's let's go ahead and see what the results are here. All right, so this is helpful. So a fair amount of you say that you visit the site when you see a Pathways Clearinghouse newsletter, and um, you know it, it, this is. Good. I mean, there's a fair amount that haven't used the site or haven't heard of it until today. So, you know, what we really want to do is give you an overview today of the different ways that you can use the website and, you know, just provide a glimpse of how this might be a helpful resource to you. All right. So I will go ahead and switch over to the website demonstration. So this is the home page of the Pathways to Work Evidence Clearinghouse uh, website. And um, just before we just before we get into the, the demo, I wanted to point you to um, some information that I highlighted before. So you can see the number of studies that have been reviewed to date um, down here um, and the number of interventions that have been reviewed. Um, one other thing you might want to um, check out is this Get to Know Pathways, which is a video that provides a, a sense from um, uh, uh, employment service providers about the ways that you might want to use the Pathways Clearinghouse website. And I highlighted staying up to date through our newsletter, and you can do that by um, uh, entering your email here to stay connected and, and subscribing. So I'll go ahead and focus on um, uh, the fine interventions that work search. And, you know, I want to do this by sort of guiding us by a particular search. So suppose you're interested in looking for interventions that help um, uh, cash assistance recipients increase their earnings. Um, and you may wonder which interventions are creating the most sizable increase in earnings. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how you do that. So you would start with find interventions that work. And you have the ability to use the, um, the filters on the, the left side here where you can filter by the outcomes that you're most uh, interested in. So we can select increasing earnings and um, you know, we, uh, if this search is guided by focusing on cash assistance recipients, you can select that as part of the population as well. But you can see that you can select sort of the full host of outcomes as well as different participant characteristics. You can even search by services that the intervention should provide. If you go ahead and select apply, um, that takes our list of potential interventions down to 23. So again, this is these are the interventions that are focused on increasing earnings for cash assistance recipients. And if you want to really find those interventions that have had the greatest increase in earnings, you can click on this column for increased earnings, or you can achieve the same thing by clicking um, size of increase in earnings from the drop down. But notice you can do the same for um, uh, other, uh, other outcomes. So one thing I want to draw your attention to is, you know, you one one way you might uh, want to look at this information is sort of, you know, looking at each of the individual interventions, and you can do that. And the site is designed so that you can see which ones have favorable impacts. So we indicate that by this supported icon, which means there's favorable impacts on uh, these particular outcomes. 
So let's just take uh, an example intervention. We'll look at this Los Angeles County uh, Transitional Subsi Subsidized Employment Program. So this is information that's standard across um, uh, interventions and particularly those that have favorable findings. But you can find sort of a snapshot of information about the content of the intervention and um, information about the implementing organization. But below, further down the page, this is where you get the snapshot summary of, you know, for a given intervention, what are the outcomes that um, the intervention has impacts on? So just in looking at this particular intervention, um, you can see that there's an increase in earnings in the short term of about $2,100 per year. So the, what this is showing you is that there's an increase in, in earnings in the short term for participants that uh, participated in the intervention, as opposed to those that were in a comparison group. And you can see that you have similar information across all of the outcomes that we look at in the Pathways Clearinghouse. So scrolling down a bit further, um, you can also uh, find information about the sample characteristics, as I mentioned, or the regions that were that was examined uh, for this particular intervention, and the race and ethnicity of the participants. Um, and then as you scroll down further, you can get to the implementation details. Um, and this provides you with a snapshot of information about the dates that were covered in the original study and the organizations that were responsible for implementing the intervention. So I, I won't go through these in detail, but you can certainly take a look at the information that's provided. But the intent here is to really build on the brief description that's included earlier um, to provide more detail that gives you a sense of how of how um, a, a given intervention can be implemented in your context. And I think you know some of the key questions that we want users to take away when they look at this information is thinking about, you know, is this an intervention that was implemented in a similar uh, context to mine? Are the clients similar um, to the participants? Are my clients similar to the participants um, in the interventions that we've reviewed? Or are the partner organizations similar to ones that I would typically partner with? Um, that is, that's the kind of information that you can begin to pull from these implementation details as you think about new interventions to um, implement. So I will, so that's the kind of information that again, you can find across different intervention pages. And I just want to, I'll wrap up the demo, but I just want to go back and, and show you where you can find some additional information. Um, so I've mentioned the uh, protocol for the Pathways Clearinghouse. You can find that under this tab for under other Pathways resources. Um, so you might want to access the protocol to answer questions like, you know, what are the kinds of outcomes that the Pathways Clearinghouse has reviewed or to get a little bit more information about the standards. Now, there were a couple of questions about that, so we wanted to point that out. All right. <laughs> But I will go ahead and stop the demo and take us back to the presentation. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ella Gifford Hawkins, who's a senior program analyst here at um, Mathematica. Um, and she is a former um, Larimer County works manager and a longtime Pathways Clearinghouse stakeholder that's really been pivotal in, in thinking about this implementation detail uh, information. So I'll turn it to Ella to talk about how she thinks practitioners may be able to use that information. Thank you, Diana. Um, sure. So I've been involved in this project for a long time, and I am so passionate about this because it makes research and findings accessible to practitioners. So why is this important? Uh, program managers, practitioners are dealing with budgets that are limited. They want uh, better program outcomes. They're functioning in a changing world with limited resources. So how do we make decisions? How do we make the best decisions? And how do we get the information that we need to make those decisions? At the end of the day, practitioners are very practical because they're implementers. So how do you take this information, implement a practice that may be uh, a pilot or something innovative? The site can help you figure out some of those questions because the implementation details 
uh, were born as a result of the conversations that practitioners had with OPRE and the other stakeholders. So some of the parts that I would like you to take a look at when you're um, looking at the site, the clearinghouse, is we're, we're interested in long-term wage gain, skills de development, job retention, and, and education training outcomes, right? So when I, as a practitioner, am considering what I could do differently, I have a lot of questions. So when was the study done? Uh, how long were the participants followed? Because if they're followed for a long time, we know that often in TANF, you may not see the outcomes right away. You want to know what's happening long term so you can get information there. Who implemented the intervention? Um, can I relate to the folks who implemented the innovation? Do they look like me? Or if they don't look like me, can I learn something from them? Say it's in a very urban area, but I'm in a rural area. I still may get some ideas about what I could do differently. Who was served? So we know that across the United States, we have very diverse communities. We serve different folks. I want to know who was served. And that helps me figure out can I relate to this and what could I do with it? What were the services? I'd like to know a better, uh, more in-depth description of services because as an implementer, a practitioner wants to know how do they make this happen? And good implementation is what makes different and new practices stick. What were the partnerships? Who is helping this implementer in terms of rolling out these new or different services? Who's doing that? What partnerships do I have that I could leverage in my community? What was the service intensity? So what did it require to do this successfully? We know that that, that differs across programs, but I would like to know that information ahead of time. It may not be that I do it exactly, but then I know which questions to ask. What staffing was needed? Do I have the right staff members? If not, can I train them on some of the pieces that might be needed? There might be people who do intake. There might be others who do orientation. So, you know, by reading the implementation details, you can learn more about who was involved. What was the local context? We know that if you're in an urban setting versus a rural setting, versus one state or another, your resources, your communities look different. So I wanna know about your, the context of this particular study. What was the funding source? And part of what happens here is that we all have opportunities, well, many of us have opportunities to apply for grant funding. And then we wanna know what that looks like. How can I make this work? Do I have a new proposal that I could submit? Does it fit within the context of the funding? Or again, can I get some new ideas from the implementation details? What was the cost per participant? And was there any kind of comparison of costs and benefits? Um, and some of that um, might not be done in numbers so much, but a sense of was it worth the cost? I think it's always helpful to know when somebody's implementing, do they believe that there is a payoff in terms of the uh, services? And then the other part that you can do is when you find these studies with implementation details, you can compare the studies that had the implement implementation details to see what the differences and similarities were. So how might I use this information? And one of the things that I was thinking about is that as we were going through the pandemic, we had to do work differently. That was both challenging and rewarding we had some things we thought that never could happen. We had to work virtually. We served customers virtually. There are a lot of things that happened, right? But we also uncovered the depth of the technology divide. So when I was thinking, how might I do this? See, I believe that my program participants need some technology training before they can move into certain careers. So I would start searching on the clearinghouse about training, increased earnings, um, and pieces like that. And then it makes me think of how I might make this work and what is possible. So what I love about the implementation details is it gives you enough information to start formulating ideas and making plans, maybe applying for grants, maybe 
redesigning your program services based on what you've learned through the pandemic. So those are some ways that I would say that uh, this is critical for decision makers when you have budgets, you have staffing, you have a desire for improved uh, program outcomes. Uh, it is one source where you can find a ton of information and the implementation details really speak to practitioners. So we're going to have a panelist discussion. And what I would encourage you to do is as we're having the discussion, please submit questions for the panelists. Um, so I would like to introduce, and I'm gonna have them introduce themselves uh, more fully, Erin Quinn from Massachusetts and Isabel Vita from Colorado. So Isabel and Erin, could you introduce yourselves a little more fully, please? Sure. Hi, everybody. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, Isabel. Um, my name is Erin Quinn. I'm the director of the Employment and Training Programs at the Massachusetts Department of Transitional Assistance. So the department um, administers the state's TANF program as well as our SNAP program. Um, there, I, I currently oversee the DTA's Pathways to Work program, which are our employment education and employment opportunities um, for both our TANF and our SNAP recipients. Um, I also oversee the work on our whole family approach to job, which includes all of our statewide collaborations to improve service delivery um, and access for young parents, um, and also um, represent the work for our transitional age youth task force um, and all, all other various cross secretariat opportunities to improve outcomes for children and families. Thank you, Erin. Hello, everybody. I'm Isabel Veda from Archuleta County, which is Pagosa Springs, Colorado. And we are on the southwest corner of Colorado, so we're definitely rural. I am the resource manager for the Archuleta County Department of Human Services, and that entails supervising all of the eligibility programs. So that's food assistance, Colorado Works, adult financial Medicaid, long-term care. Um, I also supervise child support services, so I really get the opportunity to see Colorado Works from beginning to end, if you will. Um, I work very closely with our works coach. I came from working in Larimer County for 10 years with 20 coaches to working with one and trying to implement the same services. So it's been it's been a challenge. I also supervise, supervise our fraud investigations unit, um, which doesn't focus so much on catching people, but in just intervention and um, giving them information on just making sure everything is correct and trying to work with them, not against them. So that's what I do. Thank you, Isabel. So Isabel, I'm going to direct the first question to you. In your role as resource manager for the Archuleta County Department of Human Services, you and your team transformed the county, which represents a rural area similar to those other administrators may be working in. Can you talk about what you might be most interested in as you explore implementation information? Sure, um, probably one of my favorite topics to talk about because when I think about it, I'm um, always trying to come up with new ideas, new plans, new designs, new projects, um, and, and not necessarily things that are brand new. Sometimes not reinventing the wheel is good. And that's what I like about the clearinghouse to get all of those ideas. Um, but some of the things we've done, um, my director is very strategic in using our TANF funds to create contracts to work with our community partners, which I haven't seen that in very many other communities. And so um, something that I can just share with you, um, we contract with our Rise Above Violence um, program here in Archuleta County, and we provide training to our eligibility technicians, to child support technicians, to fraud, to child welfare, through TANF dollars, about a trauma-informed approach, approaches to working with those families experiencing domestic violence, um, which is just a, an amazing experience to see everybody learn and grow and implement that information and in talking to their clients. It's, it's really inspiring. 
Um, we contract with Aspire, which is a local pregnancy center for a fatherhood program and for parenting classes. Um, and they, we just make sure that they're making under the $75,000 a year, um, which makes them be able to work with the TANF program on this, the contract basis. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to be very low income and meet a TANF eligibility to be on regular basic cash assistance. Um, we work with the summer program where we provide slots for kids to be safe during the summer while their parents are working. And although this is part of the creativity um, that our director implemented, which is fascinating, um, we weren't able to do that because of the pandemic last summer. So instead, regrouped with the local school district to provide food and delivery to those school-aged children. So we moved the funds from one area to another um, and able, you know, and able to serve the community. It was just brilliant. Um, we do a backpack program for kids at school, um, and I could go on and on. But the point I'm trying to make is that I look for new ideas in new ways, and we are constantly our leadership team talking about ways to help our community. Um, just last week, we had a single dad who um, had to go into quarantine for COVID. So immediately, we were able to within. I would say two hours, coordinate a place for him to be to quarantine. I worked with our local senior center to get food delivered to his motel room for two weeks. And it just was so beautiful that our community works so well together and we were able to pull that off. Um, so I think that's, that's how I look at implementation is just being able to be creative and proposing new things all the time. Sometimes they say no, sometimes they don't, so. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. So Erin, the next question is for you. So as Director of Employment and Training Services in Massachusetts, you've spoken extensively about your needs for evidence and in particular, implementation information. Can you describe how in your own work, you use details about the way prior interventions were carried out? Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, the state perspective is often different than the local perspective. And a lot of the things that we're looking at, especially when we're trying to innovate in the policy area, is where do state policies and procedures get in the way, right, of local service delivery? And where, where, can, we, where can we make more efficiencies, right? So I think we're really focused on what is the best information and research out there right now? Um, and what is the evidence support? And what works, what other state state agencies and organizations are doing something similar. And then as you've spoken about really getting into the implementation, right? The meat of it, um, how is it implemented? What did it cost? What are the partnerships? I think that, um, you know, when you're at the state level, you're always looking at like moving this huge barge <laughs> as opposed to, you know, being able to move as quickly as you might want to in policy spaces. So the, the greater body of evidence that you have and the greater information that you have around um, the implementation of in interventions that have been proven to be effective just makes the ability to push the needle in terms of policy easier, right? And, th and that's really what we're trying to do at the state level is just figure out what is in the way. I think a lot of times it's about stripping away some of, some of the barriers that we've created inadvertently for ourselves um, to let the people that are on the ground really be able to affect the change and to get the service and the service delivery out as quickly and as effectively as possible. So in my position, that's really what I'm looking for is how do I get this information and how am I able to utilize it in a way that affects policy change, that, that strips away procedures that are ineffective, that are inefficient. Um, and this type of a clearinghouse helps support that work, right? As it grows, as that body of research grows, um, as the evidence around the interventions that are effective or not effective grows, as you know, Isabel said, you don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, and we can learn from one another instead of every single bureaucracy trying to go through the same steps at the same time. Because it's challenging. That's one of the first questions you get is, what are your peers doing? What are other states doing? What's happening right now? Um, and that takes a lot of time you know, to cultivate all that information and get it together. Thank you, Erin. Erin and Isabel, it was fascinating to uh, watch you both talk about this and how your situations are different, but where you also share some common values and interest. 
So the next question is for both of you. When you are searching for evidence on interventions, information about effectiveness across um, outcome domains like employment, earnings, public benefit receipt, education and training may be the first piece of information you're interested in. Given your experience with the site, what are some of the aspects of implementation information that you find most compelling? How would you use that information in your decision making? And is there information that you expected to see but could not find on the website? So that was actually quite a few questions. Um, who would like to start? I don't mind going this time. Oh, Darren, you go. I'll let you no, go. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So um, I really liked the site because it had um, consistent updated information. And I think, you know, I, I'm a social worker. So um, in grad school, I did a lot of research. Um, and maybe that's why I love the clearinghouse so much. But the biggest barrier, I think, to having that type of information is getting it and keeping it updated. So even having a local resource guide in a small or large community, you have to have that person behind the scenes making sure that it's relevant current information or just that it is, um, you know, you're looking at sample sizes, they're still true and correct. You're looking at implementation, um, all those different things. Um, I think I'm always looking for the outcomes of the research, and that's one of the things I couldn't quit combing through the clearinghouse because I, I wanted to get to the end of the book, right? So um, that was really fascinating. Um, and I like to look at all aspects of programs from like funding to employing to you know, who it's helping, why it's helping, um, the population served. And it doesn't matter the community size. I think that you could make it fit every shoe if you really um, thought about it and tried. Um, information I think I expected to see, maybe were a little more informations or information about grandparents, um, intervention for grandparents raising their children while on TANF and what resources there are for them or what can we start for them to support them because they're not always part of the cash grant because they're, they're grandparents and they have retirement but they they already raised their babies they're having to, they're not knowing what to do with the two and three year olds so i don't think there's enough support so i would love to see a program a community has come up with in terms of that and i'm always fascinated with the two gen um two generational approach in child support specifically um because we we need to break down those silos and we need to give folks access to other programs without creating barriers for them so that would be something that i would really love to see more information on um because i would comb through that for hours so thank you <laughs> thank you isabel Erin. and I, I think that's funny you you said a lot of what i wanted to say right you want to get to the end of the book um, and really looking for like that outcomes data, right? Like what, what's what's the answer? What's the perfect answer? And we know with these types of challenges, we don't we don't have that. And I think that I love the um, the structure of the clearinghouse. I love the ability to look at things like um, study quality, the intervention description, um, the sample the sample characteristics, right? Population characteristics, um, the services that were provided, the design. And I, I think that what we all struggle with is when we're trying to innovate in this space, keeping all that information up to date, right? And having it be like right at the tips of your fingers around what's happening right now versus what you've actually had the time to do a quality evaluation on. And so I think that that gap between you've had a little bit of time to look at the outcome data from something that happened five years ago, 10 years ago, versus what's happening right now and what are people experiencing, I think is not, um, it's it's not a deficit of the, of the clearinghouse. It's it's just the reality of, of the work that we're doing. Um, so trying to get that like immediate finger on the pulse of who's innovating and what they're doing versus being able to have that long view and have some outcome data of, um, you know, previous work is, I think, just, it, it, it's not really, it, you know, it, it, it's not something that we can solve through a website, but I think that's always a challenge for all of us. Thank you, Erin. 
So I am going to turn it back over to Diana. Sure. Thanks, Ella. So this is just a, a, a note, but just before we turn over to the audience questions piece. But um, you know, you can stay connected with the Pathways Clearinghouse by following at Mathematica Now uh, on social media or at OPRE under a, un, underscore ACF, um, and you can get the latest updates there. And you can use the Pathways to Work hashtag. Um, and certainly, you can join the email list, which I previewed a little bit earlier. And certainly, we want you to visit the site. So the URL is is listed there as well. But it looks like. We have a good amount of time to jump into audience questions. So I certainly want to encourage people to um, continue to submit questions. Uh, we received a, a ton in advance, and I think you all have, have submitted a couple now. So we can jump right in. Um, let's see. So one of the first questions is thinking about how are implementation details coded? And, and I can cover this one. But um, the implementation details that we've identified and listed on the site are extracted from the original studies that have been reviewed. So we've set up a process where we identified a protocol um, and we had many stakeholders sort of review the protocol to make sure that we were pulling out the right elements that were important. Um, so thinking about um, the organizations, the partner organizations that were involved or getting more detail on the services implemented um, or more detail on the specific participants. So um, we've set up a protocol to identify implementation information from those individual studies. And um, we, we go ahead and extract that information and we do send that um, uh, that sort of uh, pro the filled out protocol that we um, where we pull the implementation information. We send that to a key informant, so that's typically an author um, from the original study, or you know if it's a program model, if there's that particular instance, we'll we'll send it to someone affiliated with the model to see if they have any additions or to make sure that our interpretation from what was included um, in the the original study was correct. So that, that's our process and that's how we um, uh, obtain inf uh, implementation information. And just just to build on that, I think there's a there's another question here that's kind of related uh, about the implementation details piece. And it asks whether there is a formula to determine the cost per participant. So I think this question is asking about that cost um, uh, piece that we list on the um, implementation details part of the page and cost again that's pulled from the uh, individual study and we report that as the study authors reported it so they may include information on cost per participant or um, if they've conducted a cost benefit analysis we'll report that detail as the study authors reported it but we don't have a specific formula that we're employing that implementation information is really drawn on what the the study authors are reporting so i hope that's helpful to address those first questions um, let's see so I'm going to also bring in other members of the Pathways Clearinghouse team to respond to some of these. So there's another kind of foundational question in here. Um, how does the Pathways Clearinghouse measure outcomes? So I'll turn that over to Dana Rotz, our principal investigator. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be here today. So the Pathways Clearinghouse looks at the measures of outcomes that are provided by the research studies that we include. And we uh, specifically look for outcomes related to employment, earnings, public benefit receipt, and education and training attainment. We use the measures that the study authors provide um, and we assess those measures uh, essentially using our standards for the quality of the study design underlying them. And based on that assessment, we include the findings and the outcomes in, um, in our review. Thanks a lot, Dana. Let's see. So there are some questions about 
I guess, looking for the services that particular interventions include. So one of them is, can I find information on interventions that include services such as sectoral training, um, employment retention services, and work-based learning? And the answer is yes. So I sort of, when I went through the demonstration for the website, when you go to the Find Interventions, that work tool, on the left-hand side, you can choose from these three primary buckets of filters. Um, and searching by services that are offered is one of them. Um, and so the services that this person mentioned in their question, those are all listed as options, where when you're executing a search, you're basically identifying studies that have included um, that particular service among the other services that they offer. So you can certainly you know, use the search in that way. Let's see, other questions. Um, there is a really good question here about whether, the question asks, is there a way to identify an intervention that was made in a specific state rather than creating multiple searches? And yes, this is something that we're um, exploring in, in a future enhancement for the website. Will you will be able to uh, do that filter by state? So that that's a good question, but it's something that, you know, has certainly come up and we're looking to address that in a future update. Let's see, and you can continue to submit um, questions in the chat. Um, I'm sorry, or in the Q&A. All right, so I see another question. Okay, so this is specifically for Dana. Um, and I might ask this person to submit um, sort of a sort of an expansion on this question if you have one. But the question is, can Dana expand on the quality measurement piece again? So. Dana, is that enough for you to be able to? Yeah, definitely. So I think what this question is about, and my apologies if I, uh, my apologies if I'm misinterpreting it, is how we assess the quality of the study findings um, to determine uh, how to rate them. Um, and just very briefly, uh, we assess uh, studies based on their design and their analysis. Um, for design, we look at was it a randomized control trial where individuals were randomly assigned to the intervention or the comparison groups, and was it a quasi-experimental design? We also look for random assignment studies, um, whether the individuals who are randomly assigned to the intervention and comparison groups are the same individuals as those who are included in the sample uh, whose outcomes are being analyzed. Um, and then for quasi-experimental design studies and for some randomized controlled trials as well, we look at whether the intervention comparison groups were similar at baseline. So before the intervention began, does it look like the two groups that are being compared in order to estimate uh, impacts are similar? And we also look at the analysis methods in terms of what type of controls are included uh, in the in like the analysis that folks are doing. So it's a pretty holistic um, assessment of the quality of the causal design. It doesn't really get into the quality of implementation. It actually doesn't get at all into the quality of implementation, but it doesn't get into the quality of any implementation research that's being done or any descriptive research. It's very much focused on you know, do we think that the estimates that the authors provide give a good estimate of the causal effect of the study? Um, and all of that is outlined in substantial detail um, in the, the handbook. I see another question um, here saying, um, about the measures. Uh, I think this is about the measures uh, that, we're, that we're getting. Um, we generally think that the measures that we have of things like employment and earnings and educational attainment and public benefit receipt are kind of high quality measures of the things that they're trying to measure. I think when you get into other outcome measures about things like well-being or, you know, um, mental health or, you know, or 
those types of things or achievement. Um, I think that then, you know, you have to really think seriously about whether the outcome that the authors are using are measuring the thing that they say it's measuring. But for things like earnings, employment, public benefit receipt, degrees attained, um, it's all, you know, it, it's generally has, has strong validity. Thanks a lot, Dana. And um, I just wanted to address two questions that have come up. So uh, first, this is an apology. The, the lack of closed captioning was an oversight on our part, but we typically do have that. We will be sure to provide a transcript and implement closed captioning for all future webinars. So I, I do apologize about that. Um, and then following up, um, there's an additional question about the filters. And the question is whether the filters include populations such as pathways to work for persons with disabilities or broken by ethnicity. So um, to answer the question, yes, on the website, you are able to look uh, at the filters to um, select, for example, people with disabilities or other diff other characteristics of the population. I think the example that I used in the demo was cash assistance recipients, but there's a wide range of potential filters to use. Um, and in terms of race and ethnicity, you can look at the race and ethnicity broken down by the intervention, and then we have that information at the, the study level as well. But when you look at an intervention, Individual, individual intervention as you scroll down on the page, that's where you can find out the details about the population that the intervention was implemented with. Okay. And then I think there's a, so, uh, and another quick question we have in here, will there be a, a webinar of this? And absolutely, we, um, you know, well, we include, we record all these webinars and we'll include it on the website for later viewing, absolutely. Um, there was one other question that I want to direct back to our, um, our panelists uh, just a bit. And I think, you know, it would be helpful for the panelists to help our, our audience um, think about instances where, you know, you might scan the website and, you know, find that there's an intervention implemented in a context that's different from yours. So uh, let's say, um, Isabel, for example, if people are searching for interventions um, and they found one that seems like it could be a fit, but it looks like it was implemented in an urban context and they're in a rural context, what kinds of questions might you address as you begin to look at that intervention, um, recognizing that it might not be a fit for the exact same location, but are, are there other ways that you can start to start. use that information? So I wanted to pose that to, to both panelists, but maybe we start with Isabel. Sure. So I think that I wouldn't do any of that work on my own, even from ground zero. So I would pull my teams into um, just this thinking mode and old school style and get out a whiteboard and start writing ideas down and what how it could work in our community. Um, kind of looking at that equity lens of what barriers are to maybe get that going in our community, how we could overcome those, who our stakeholders would be. So it wouldn't just be one little aspect that I'd look at, but I'd pull in all of my brains to be able to sift through the information and see where we could start. Even if we used a portion and then we started going down another path. It was still helpful for us to be able to recognize that and um, maybe come up with some new ideas and be very creative. That's helpful. Erin, did you have any other thoughts there? I did. I was thinking, you know, specifically, you know, the last year, especially with COVID, has given us the opportunity to reexamine a lot of our policies. And there are a lot of things that we suspended um, in Massachusetts around the TANF work program requirements, things like orientations, um, wanting to revise our assessments, um, looking at things like time limits, sanctions, right? And I think that this is one tool, right? It's, it's not all inclusive of all the body of research that's out there. But to be able to go back and revisit, you know, on the research that's been done and the interventions that have been studied around things like time limits and sanctions in other states, uh, sometimes you just want to know what's out there, right? And if there isn't conclusive evidence, 
having a, some some space to go to to say that you know what there is inconclusive evidence is helpful in and of itself. Um, so I think that this this is an example um, of a tool that's useful in that space to say you know what we haven't proven one way or the other if if certain interventions were successful around things like time limits or sanctions and that's part of innovating. Um, but having yeah. the space to see what's out there. Um, and having the ability to, to really assess those interventions that have tried to get more information around those types of policies. Um, this, is, this is one type of a tool that we would bring into that conversation, similar to what Isabel was saying, when you are taking out that whiteboard and trying to map out what you do have for available information and evidence. Yeah. I think that is such a valuable point, Erin. And I know, you know, we emphasize a lot of like finding the interventions with favorable findings, which certainly is important information, but it's just as important to have that information about um, where there's insufficient evidence. And that is certainly something that's highlighted on the website. And like you said, it, it provides some insight on um, what's out there. And that is the way that we hope folks will use the site. Um, I also, Diana, if I could add something yeah. else real quick. So I also sit on some policy groups. And so every chance I get, I try to join um, subgroups because what's important to me with the, in that aspect is taking some of those intervention ideas and even bringing it to the table of our larger group because the policy groups that I sit on represent the whole state of Colorado, not just Archuleta County. So I have right. in the past taken some great ideas that I've you know been um, stumbled onto and passed that up the ladder. And so it, our voices are being heard and which I really appreciate that they allow me in this position to be able to do that um, because it is creating change. And that's what we're trying to do to, you know, help our clients and stay client focused. Yeah, that that's really helpful, Isabel. It's, it's nice to hear the story of how um, this can inform, you know, your regular conversations. So. Mm -hmm. So um, there is one uh, additional question here, and we, we might have time for one more if folks want to keep submitting them. But there's a question about how often um, the website is updated with um, new interventions. And um, uh, we don't have a, a set schedule, but we do regularly update the information with information from new interventions and studies that we've reviewed. Um, the, the best way we try to keep people up to date on that is through our newsletters where we'll announce um, where there's new content. Um, we will have new content released this summer. So, um, you know, we will make sure to, to send out an update uh, indicating that. Um, but that's a good question. And we also, um, you know, as part of the newsletters we have, we also will signal when we're looking for a call for studies, for example. So we issued one last year on a call for studies of interventions that were implemented remotely, and we will be issuing a new call for studies as well. So if you're signed up for the listserv, you will see that. All right. So I... I think we're close to time and it looks like we answered most of the questions or all of the questions that I see in the queue here, but I really just want to take the time and thank our panelists for a really helpful discussion and, and helping us think through ways people can really look at the implementation details and begin to innovate. I think that's a takeaway for me. I heard that a lot as that being another jumping off point for looking at that information, but um, we will definitely make this uh, webinar available after the event and we encourage you all to visit the Pathways Clearinghouse website and um, definitely feel free to you know send an email and um, our email addresses are listed here but you can email the Pathways to Work Evidence Clearinghouse if you have a specific question. All right so thank you everyone have a great afternoon.